Konnichiwa, and welcome to this episode of Drift Hunter Nights. Join me, your host Albo, as we go deep into the mountains to explore the underground world of Japanese toge and street drifting. Hope you're ready, strap in, and let's go for a ride. This is a chronicle of my personal experience exploring the real life equivalent of Initial D. This is real street racing and drifting in the mountain roads of Gunma. This is Drift Hunter. Last time on Drift Hunter Nights, I was joined by my good friends Ollie and Ollie, who came all the way to Japan from Europe to write an article about Japanese street racing and toge drifting for a website called High Snowbody. You can check out the article in the description box down below. Alright, before we jump right back into the action, I want to let you know that there's a section at the end of this video where I go into a bit of a Q&A and let, let you guys know a little bit more about living in Japan and a little bit more background detail about, uh, about the underground drifting scene here in Japan. Alright, let's jump right back into the story where one of the cars that we were driving is experiencing some troubles. And for once, it's not my car. After a few hours on a toge, we discovered that the car battery of the rental had died, possibly because we had left the hazards on. Fortunately, I had some cables in my car and we were able to jump the Loner 86's battery. Can we see on here? I was, I was, uh, Ollie, other Ollie was saying like, there's like a whole lot of people who have come out now. Yeah, yeah. I was saying there's like this like Paul Walker type character who has rolled in and this, uh... Okay. And this, no, I'm talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> and a red, and a red hot Shiroku. Like, yeah. They want to see this guy's skills. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, he's just stuck. Yeah, well, we're, we're uh, up and rolling again, but yep, he's yep. still not going to see any skills, unfortunately. It was actually really funny. While we waited for the 86 batteries to charge, I decided to go around to see if anybody would be willing to give me a ride. I was itching to hop into a car because this is one of my favorite toges. It's featured in several initial D episodes and is really long and windy. Ollie, how is this different from uh, what you imagine it would be like? Um... I hoped it would be like this. <laughs> it's hard to tell you what, what I imagined because I tried not to overthink it. But yeah, it's perfect. It's perfect. It's like amazing because you. No one's trying to act cool or something. Everyone is pretty calm about it. Like the guy I drive, drove with knew exactly what he was doing. It's kind of it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It seems to be a community. Biggest respect to those people, but I'm not sure if that would be my thing. <laughs> well, what do you think it takes to get this good? Uh, she's low, so. Fuck, man. That was a dope ass. Bro. Yeah, that, that suits up the Parisa. Um, what it needs to do this, shit loads of commitment. Like, really shit tons of commitment, right? You gotta be scared you crash the car, you gotta con constantly work on your driving. Sometimes it's raining right now, then you just gotta adjust to it. Lots of commitment. Yeah, I'm gonna, this is a cool shot. I'm gonna film you filming. It's time. 
times like this that I think, wow, my life is literally initial D right now. This scene, the colors, the setting, the pink skyline pulling away, it looks too ridiculously anime to be real. I think back to my days playing initial D at the local arcade and I'm stunned by how they got it so right. Keep in mind that the camera can't quite capture the sensation of speed or the slope of the mountain. Because we're going uphill, you can really feel the gravity pulling you down and side to side as our K-car shovels up the mountain, lagging behind the much more high-powered skyline. These guys possess an amazing level of car control and confidence, and they're having so much fun it's hard to fault them. While we slide sideways around this bend at 100 kilometers an hour, I understand why they do this. It's easy to see why they are drawn to the mountain. It's obvious why this Hashide culture has emerged in the boonies of Japan. This is, quite simply, the coolest, funnest thing you can do 100 kilometers in any direction. Downhill version of a course is a completely different beast than uphill. Whereas uphill, a big engine with lots of power is almost necessary to get and stay sideways. In the downhill portion, gravity enters the equation and the car can simply use momentum to drift. Or rather, I shouldn't say simply because it is much more difficult and dangerous to drift downhill than uphill or on level ground. My theory is that one of the reasons that Japanese hashiria from the toge with low-powered cars are such skilled drivers, despite their age, is because they learn to drift downhill on the toge. Here, they utilize momentum and rely on technique and courage, instead of pure power, to discover where their limits lie. A few minutes after we got back and were sitting around talking off camera, a white car pulled up, several people piled out, and two men assaulted the driver I was just with. They were yelling something Brazilian so I didn't understand, but they dragged him into their car and sped away. We were really scared, but a few hours later, he came back with a couple black eyes and a bloody lip to retrieve his car. It seemed to be some sort of family dispute. This event served to underscore the underground feeling of our outing. So, uh, Brazilians. Uh, what, 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 what were they saying? Uh, no idea. I don't speak Brazilian. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the... the people I talked to told us that fights and altercations were relatively uncommon, especially in this day and age. So we were pretty surprised, to say the least. After things had calmed down a little bit, I wanted to go for a ride with the pink R32 Skyline that was in front of us. The driver, despite his young age, was incredibly skilled, and fortunately, he obliged my request to go for a spin. 
シリアにこういうシフトはあの人気じゃないですかなんでですかこれは昔の,あの中にお花がさ入ってるんですよ花がフラワーがドライフラワーが入ってるドライフラワーが入ってるおしゃれだなちょっと派手ですね<笑>和の心和のテイスト和のテイストさでも私はなんかすごくなんかあかっこいいというよりなんかドリフトスタイルドリフトスタイルドリフトスタイルジャパンジャパンそうですね混ぜドリフトスタイル混ぜドリフトスタイル,<笑>タイル<笑> It's really cool なんかドリフト途中によく読,読んでますか水温、気温、油圧油圧は常に読みます油圧、水温圧がかかんなくなった、水温が高いっていうのをよく見てますね。はい、あのスピードとかよく見ますか。全く見ないです。見たことないですか。<笑>もう本当にここだけしか見てない。ええー、そうですか、ね。タク、タクも。タク、タクも見ない。ずっとレブ、ずっとレブ。はい。<笑>ずっとレブ。で、ディレフト途中になんかどこ見るんですか。本当途中大体。進む方向、次のコーナー、次のコーナー。はい。で見てますね、やっぱりあのこのトゲあの知るはずですかはいそうですねもし知らないトゲで走らないということですかいや絶対走りますよ知らないトゲでも何回か通ればどんな道かなって分かるんではいあやばいかっこいい行ってみます My friend, who I'll call Pinky to retain his privacy, has an unbelievable level of control over his R32. For those of you who have never been in a car that's going sideways, let me try to explain what the sensation is like. First of all, your first time riding in a car mid drift, your body has a very visceral, automatic reaction. Basically, you panic a little bit. Your brain associates the feeling of losing traction and going sideways as a life threatening event. Because unless you're a drifter, well, that's exactly what it would be. Second, at least for me, my brain struggles to comprehend how the driver can anticipate, set up, and chain consecutive drifts around multiple corners. As someone who's much more used to grip racing, the lines simply don't make sense the first few times. In fact, they barely make sense to me even now. Finally, one of the things I find most interesting is that often, The more skilled and experienced the driver, the smoother the whole run feels. In fact, though the actual speed and g forces may be much, much higher, the car feels like it's just floating down a road, swinging from side to side. As a passenger, I actually feel very safe, even though I've very literally put my life in the hands of someone I barely just met. It's truly incredible to be out here, experiencing the real life equivalent of Initial D on the same toge that Takumi and Keisuke raced on. But what's the difference between the anime and reality? In the anime, teams gather on the toge and battle each other one on one. According to my sources, 20 years ago, the real life scene was almost exactly like it's depicted in the anime. Intense head to head battles and fierce rivalries were common. Keep in mind that despite being relatively timeless, Initial D is originally set in the 90s. At the time, car culture was prevalent and pervasive. Nowadays, not so much. Most of the Hashiria don't race each other so much as they drift together in tandem. The vibe here is respectful and mature. People line up along the side of the road and take turns doing runs one by one. However, that's not to say that the battle mentality is completely gone. It's just gone deeper underground. In future episodes, we'll uncover the very secret of battle scene together, so make sure to subscribe. Oh. If you have enjoyed the in car footage thus far, you have to watch this last clip. We're riding in a Toyota Crescent with over 400 horsepower that belongs to one of the best Hashiria on this tow game. Professional. His driving is incredibly smooth, almost effortless, and it feels like I'm in the center of a tornado. I won't say anything more so you can enjoy the rest of the run and all of his glory.
are fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's a real okay. That was amazing. Wow, dude, that was great. How do you feel right now? How do you feel when you drift? Oh, it's just fun. Just fun and hot. Yeah. Do you put the window down or window up? Uh, oh, it's open. Uh, oh, almost close. Oh, okay. Here, just Should here. I close? Is it better to close? Okay. Just here. Okay. Wow. Oh, I have to clean. <laughs> I have to clean down. Yeah. But right, yeah. Downhill, just take it easy, right? Yeah. You you want? <laughs> it's up to you. It's up to you. you got to see the difference between the drifting in the skyline and the crest here. The two drivers have very different styles, but one thing they both have in common is that they absolutely memorize the course like the back of their hands. They're pretty sure that they can do the whole thing blindfolded. Telling me that there was two different types, yeah, uh, of a, two different ways to attack this mountain. Yeah. Um, so earlier I went out with a guy in a MR2, yeah, you know, MRS, and um, in some ways I found that scarier because I think we were going faster, or it was, there was certainly more of a, a sense of speed. Yeah. Um, the drifting was fun, the really good fun. So it, I really noticed the difference. Oh yeah, the period come back. Overheat! After this, there aren't many more clips due to some technical difficulties. By around 2.30 a.m., everyone started heading back home, so we packed up our things and departed from the toge. Yeah, yeah, let's roll. I was glad that, after months of planning, our night of drift hunting was successful. Alright, so we're at McDonald's. It's been a long night, eating a chicken cheeseburger. And Pretty eventful night. Um, met a lot of cool people today, and the guys from the bank, from the site had a really great time as well. Um, pretty tired, so we're gonna head back, get some rest. Finally got back to uh, a place. All right, morning. 
So, uh, guys from the site, from High Society, taking off. Yeah, you guys have a good time? The article that Ollie wrote was, in my opinion, fantastic, and I recommend that you check it out. Thus ends the first episode of this side series, Drift Hunter Nights. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, let's jump to the Q&A. Have a safe trip back. Hey guys, alright, so now we're going to get to the Q&A section. Alright, so one of the first questions I received was, do you drift on the mountain passes? Well, actually, no I don't. My Miata is actually set up for grip because I've got really sticky tires. But one of the reasons that I haven't dived into the drifting scene myself as a drifter is basically because it costs a ton of money in terms of all the consumables, tires, things that break. And I really only have my car and I need it to get around, I need to get it to work. So I can't risk my only ride uh, to go drifting in the mountains aside from the fact that I don't do anything bad on the mountains. I follow the speed limit, of course. Alright, so one of the most common questions I received was about the police and how they react and how they respond, how they feel about the, the Hashiria, about the underground scene uh, over here in, in Gunma and in the surrounding area. And I would say that basically in my experience, the police are generally very lenient. However, in certain Toges, for example, in Akagi, the, to the police are, are quite quite a bit more strict. However, in other places, like for example, Miyogi, the, the police are pretty nice. I mean, there have been situations where the police come and they basically just tell everybody to go home. Of course, in, in other places, when the when the police are coming in, when the, when, the, when the cops are coming in, everybody just kind of books it and and uh, and gets out of there as fast as they can. But in general, the police in Japan are, I would say, in my opinion, uh, pretty lenient, especially compared to the police back home in Canada and, and in the U.S. and uh, in, in other countries. All right. So the next question I received was. How did the locals view an outsider trying to get involved in their car scene? I imagine some would be fairly enthusiastic to share their culture, whereas others may be quite hostile or secretive. This is a great question, and I, I think that my experience may not necessarily be the exact same as somebody else's, maybe some other foreigner uh, who, who's, who's uh, deciding to buy a sports car and, and, and go driving in the mountains and to join the scene, as it were. Basically, as you guys know, I'm making a documentary, so a lot of time I'm carrying this huge camera. Well, it's not that big, but I'm carrying this camera around. And, and so, understandably, people are sometimes a little bit apprehensive and they're wondering well, what's going on. And, but basically, as soon as, I, as soon as I explain in Japanese what I'm doing, what I'm trying to do, how I'm trying to share the culture of, of the Hashiria with the world. A lot of people are very, very, they're very interested in, in, in the project and, and they think it's really cool that, that a, a foreigner would, would come to, come to uh, Japan and kind of be immersed enough in, in, in so much that they can speak the language, uh, which I think is, is one of the main things because I speak Japanese. I'm not speaking English and just kind of jumping in uh, out of nowhere, like, well, I jump in out of nowhere sometimes, but I'm speaking in Japanese, which I, I think helps to relax people and uh, helps them warm up to me. So I can't, I really can't speak for how how other people would be, would be welcomed uh, in different scenes. Of course, every scene is different around Japan, and <clears throat> of course I can only speak to the scenes that I've been to, but definitely... I can tell you I can tell you guys this much at least. At the beginning it was quite hard for me because I didn't really know anybody and I was literally sometimes emerging from the darkness to and I would say hi to people and, and explain that hey I'm 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 Albo, I came from Canada, I'm working on this documentary project and it would be cool if I hopped into your car. Sometimes it works, sometimes people give me weird looks, but eventually I made some friends and here we are. So yeah, great question. Okay, next question is um, it's about living spaces. I read about how small the living spaces can be over there. So what's it like having a modified car as far as storage and workshop space uh, are concerned? Do you always have to take it to a shop to get it worked on? So I live out here in Gunma, which is relatively, well, there's a lot more space to work on, on uh, 
cars. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot more families. It's more of a suburban area. But where I live, I, I basically live in an apartment building, and I have a designated parking spot. And basically, if I want to do any 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 work in my car, I usually work on it in that little designated parking area spot. I've got jack. I've got I've got some tools in, in my in my in my boot. And so if it's for simple stuff like changing the tires or stuff like that, I will, I'll usually I'll usually try to do it uh, in my parking lot. But for anything more advanced, uh, for anything more involved than that, I basically I've got several several uh, friends, several good friends who are mechanics, and so I just take my car to their shop and I get my work done uh, over there. So I, I think that in general that's how most of the hashiria. Uh, do work on their cars, which is they have connections with people who own shops and garages and then they go there and get their work done sometimes all uh, with everybody together. It seems people don't really care if they bang up their car. They just laugh about it. Do these people actually go to work just to pay for their car? Everything just seems so expensive. How many tuners, body shops, garages are there in your area? And what happens when accidents happen on the mountain passes? Do the roads get closed? Okay, so that's a whole bunch of questions. Uh, let's go through them one by one. Okay, so first question talks about the kind of carefree attitude that people have towards their cars. I think that people here love their cars just as much as you guys love your cars in whichever country that you are in. Uh, the difference here, the difference, well not really a difference, I, I think drifters around the world kind of, they, I think drifters around the world understand that crashing your car and banging it up against the wall and stuff breaking and stuff needing, needing to be replaced it comes with the territory it comes with the territory it's all part of the game so actually for me too it, it, it's I find it quite amazing that that, uh, that that the drifters go so hard in the toge and it comes so close to the wall and sometimes that's the entire point of it to see how close you can get without actually banging up your car and I, I find it amazing I find it incredible and I think it just speaks to how much these guys love their cars and love their art. That they're willing to put their, their, basically, like, their, their, like, you guys are right. They, a lot of them, they'll, they'll work so they can make money, so they can put it into their cars. And then every once in a while, they crash their car. And it's, it's all part of being a driver. It's all part of being a, 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 a hashiriya and being part of this lifestyle. Alright, so the next part of that question is... How many tuners, body shops, and garages are there in your area? I think there are, I think there's quite a few. There's a lot of like little ones that are kind of family owned that are in, in, in um, of course there are chain garages and, and, and chains uh, that are that are like Canadian Tire back in Canada or like Pet Boys in the States. But over here there's also a lot of family owned ones which are, are, are local and which, you know, people will have connections to so that that they can go and, and get work done together. And I think that's one way that the, the Hashiri has saved a lot of money. It's uh, they, the connections that they have, they're able to get cheap tires, they're able to get the work done without labor. Oftentimes they just use the lift of their buddy's uh, garage and so they'll do the work themselves. All right, so the next part of that question was, what happens when accidents happen on the mountain passes? All right, I'll go into this more in, in, uh, in future videos because this is actually a really interesting point. But basically, it's, uh, just quickly go over it right now. It's basically handled between the two parties that, that are involved in, in a collision. Or if there's a collision with, with say, like the, the wall or, or, or the guardrail, then the, they'll just call the insurance companies and they'll, the insurance companies basically know what's going on. But it's, it's such a part of the culture that the, that it's it's they just send a tow truck and they just uh, collect the pieces of the car. All right. So uh, next question: Do the roads get closed? So sometimes the the hashiri, uh, race, sometimes the hashiri use sections of the road that are that are closed off, and sometimes no, they they actually uh, ride on, on open roads. Um, oftentimes they go at very late at night, maybe 11, 12, 1 or two, when the roads are already closed, but. Oftentimes, you know, there are there is uh, there there are stray cars that sometimes come by, and and fortunately, 
there haven't been too many accidents, at least that I know of. <clears throat> okay, next question is, do Japanese people prepare for mountain roads by training on tracks or the other way around, or do they generally stay on the mountains? Okay, I'll go into this more in, pre in uh, future episodes as well. But uh, basically, there are people, of course, who will start on the mountains and move on to the circuit. There's people who will start on the circuit and will want to try their, try their uh, tester skills uh, on, on the toge. There are people who stay just on the toge and just on, on, the, on the circuit. Because actually, they're, they're very, very different. So you're really developing two completely different driving styles. Although, this being Gunma, a lot of the people within the culture, the Hashiriya here in Gunma and the area, they do start in the toge. Okay, so another question. Uh, why do you live there? Okay, I like this question and I wanted to quickly go, go over it. Although I think in future episodes I'll definitely be going, to, going into it a lot more. Basically, I've lived in Japan since 2010. And since that time, I've fallen in love with a lot of different aspects of the culture. For one thing, it's really safe. It's a lot of fun to live here. I love the food. I love, I love how, I'm, I'm totally gonna be called a weeaboo for this, but <laughs> I'm a total nerd, but I, I don't care because I feel like living in Japan is really like living in an anime. Oh man, I can't believe I said that. All right, so let me explain. One of my favorite movies is five centimeters per second. And if you see that movie, it's incredibly beautiful. It, it really shows a lot of different aspects of, of Japanese daily life. And it, it's very beautifully shot. The point is, sections of that movie are, are, are here in Takasaki, uh, basically beside the city that I live in. And so to have seen that in the anime, and to actually go there in real life, well, it looks exactly the same, which kind of makes it feel like I, I'm living in an anime. And also, I, I kind of feel like Living in Japan, or at least living in a different country, it's kind of like a video game where all these little challenges that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis, they feel like they are, like you're you're in a dungeon and and you're you're uh, you're fighting enemies and you you've got a boss that you have to overcome and you meet people, your friends, they're like your party. So basically, life is like an RPG. I, I guess you could say that about life anywhere, but I, I think that's one of the ways that I like to view my my experience of living here in Japan. Okay, so the next question is, I heard that you have to pay extra tax on cars that are older than 8-ish years. Is that true? And how much does that suck out of your wallet? Okay, so there is a tax for older cars. I forget exactly how old now. I think it's cars that are older than 5 years old. It's called Shaken, and it's a, it's a mandatory insurance, which includes an inspection. And there's also a car tax every year. And so, Shaken works out to be, depending on the car, maybe about $1,200 every two years. And car tax is about $450 every year. So that's roughly $1,000 per year for, for, uh, for, the, for the cost to keep the car running, just, just the taxes that you have to pay and stuff like that. And that's, that's aside from the insurance that you would actually get on your car. Uh, fortunately, my insurance is not super expensive. It's pretty cheap, actually. I pay about about 60 bucks a month, and well, the flip side is my coverage isn't that great. But basically, if you have a newer car, if you got a brand new car, it's not gonna have the shock and it's not gonna have the car tax, I think. Which means, so there's a big incentive to get people to buy newer cars every year or every couple of years. But for people who are really who really love Hashire culture. Uh, for, but for people who really love cars, like the Hashiriya and, and people like me, we basically just have to pony up about a thousand bucks every year just to be able to ride our, our JDM chariots. I want to move to Japan someday. Any information on immigration, work visa, or citizenship? Okay, this is a really, really big topic. I probably, I will definitely make another video in the future going really in depth into this. But. Basically, I'll, I'll tell you guys a couple things. So, if you want to work in Japan, you need to have a work visa. You can come here on a working holiday visa, which only lasts for one year. And you can do... Well, it depends on the country, of course. So you should look that up, the working holiday visa. I came on an instructor visa as a participant on the JET program. 
So if you're accepted to the JET program, you're automatically granted a visa to work as an instructor in Japanese schools. And if you stay here for 10 years, then you can... Oh, if you stay here for 10 years without leaving the country and coming back, like leaving the country for, let's say, six months or more for an extended period of time, if you stay here for 10 years, you can get permanent residency, which basically means that you can stay as long as in Japan as long as you want without having to renew your visa every several years. So I'll, I'll definitely go into it a lot more in future videos, but for now, I would say that if you guys are interested in moving to Japan and are interested at least in the way that I did it, I would recommend that you check out the, uh, the JET program. So there, there are going to be some links in the description box down below. Alright, so the last question I'll cover is what is the best advice for people going to Japan for the first time? Alright, well, number one, have fun. And number two, bring money if you're coming here on vacation. I would say between $50 to $100 a day depending on, on the things that you want to do. And of course, if you want to travel around a lot, I really recommend that you pick up the Japan Rail Pass, which lets you take the Shinkansen, which is the bullet train, around Japan as much as you want for either uh, one week or one or two weeks, uh, I, I think. And aside from that, I would say research. Do as much research as you can before you come here. Figure out what you want to do. You don't want to come here and just kind of bum around in the hotel trying to figure out what you want to do. Come up with an, iti an itinerary and stick to it but be flexible and have fun and you're gonna have a great time guys thank you so much for watching this video i hope you found it entertaining and i hope you found the q a section helpful and informative if you haven't already please make sure to hit that like button and please subscribe if you haven't yet and of course please let me know what you thought in the comments down below comment banana if you actually watch this entire thing and lastly i have to say thank you so much to my patreon supporters it's thanks to you guys that this project continues to remain viable and continues to grow with every video. No pressure at all to join, but if you're interested in checking it out, please check out the link right here, which is for the Patreon page, and there's also a link in the description box down below. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Peace. Johnny.